Hello, everybody, and welcome to our example for today's class session on visualizing relationships. Um, what we're going to do is download some data um, about Atlanta weather, similar to what we used for the uncertainty example. And then we're going to show you how you use double y axes in a legal way, um, how to make scatterplot matrices and correlograms, and then how to uh, visualize model results. And so we'll do all of that hopefully fairly quickly here. Um, I'll be less narrative as we go through. Instead of explaining all of the different keyboard shortcuts, um, I'll just insert chunks. Just again, if you want to insert a chunk, it's Command Option I or Control Alt I. If you want to run an entire chunk, you can press Command Shift Enter or Control Shift Enter. If you want to run a specific line, you do Command Enter um, or Control Enter on Windows. And so I might accidentally say one of those things, but in general, I'll go fairly quickly, um, but walk you through how to do all of this with real data. So let's get started. So I'm here in our studio. Um, what we're going to do is create a new project. Um, again, you may have one single project for this whole class. That's great. Um, just to get into the habit of making these projects, I'm going to, again, walk through the, the process of doing it. So we're going to create a new project. We're going to make it in a new directory new R project. We'll just put it on my desktop. In real life, you'll put this somewhere um, more official. We're going to call it relationships and we're going to open it in a new session so that we'll keep um, whatever R studio session I have here open. So when I click create project, it should open up a second R studio window with the working directory pointed at um, or pointed at the correct working directory. If I look at finder now and I come to my desktop, I should have a folder called relationships and we have that rproj file there. So inside this folder, we're going to create a new folder called data. And I downloaded the CSV file for today, this Atlanta weather, and we're going to put it in that data folder um, so that we can work with it there. It, you can name it whatever you want. It doesn't have to be called data. That's just what I do. If we come back to our studio um, and look in the files panel, we can refresh that. Now we have a data folder. You can see that it's pointed at desktop relationships. You can check the console here and it says that we're pointed at desktop relationships. You can look at the, the project menu up at the top and it is also pointed at the right place. So we're all set. Um, next, we're going to create a new R markdown file where we're going to do all of our analysis. Um, I do this by going to file, new file, R markdown. I leave all that default information and then I we can put whatever we want here. Wow. Relationships and my name. And all of this other placeholder code we don't really need. So we can delete it and we're good to go. So the first thing we want to do is we want to get this data, this Atlanta weather data, into our um, environment. We want to start working with it in our studio. So what we need to do is insert a chunk, which again, you can go to insert menu or command option I. Um, we're going to call this chunk, or we're going to name this chunk because that's good practice, called load library data, libraries data. I know just because tidyverse I load it all the time, it creates lots of warnings and messages. We can turn those off in the chunk options and say warning equals false and message equals false. Okay, so here we want to say library tidyverse. And if we press command enter or control enter, it will run that line and we should have tidyverse loaded. So we want to get our data set into our um, environment here. So we're gonna use read CSV to do that. We're gonna load, we're gonna create a data set called weather underscore ATL. And that is equal to, so to get that backwards arrow, you do option minus or alt minus, read underscore CSV. And we want to look in our data folder for the data set called ATL Weather 2019. So if I press command enter, it should run it. And if we look in the environment panel, we have Weather ATL, which you can click on and you can see all of the different columns and different rows. And that's neat. Um, in yesterday's session, we added a few columns here for the weekday and for the month. 
we're not going to worry about that for this um, for this example. We're not going to do anything with like a month column or a weekday column. So we'll just leave it how it is. Um, so the first thing we want to do is we want to show the at the high temperature for the day over time. Um, and we want to use a dual y-axis that is legal. So we're going to have Fahrenheit on one side and Celsius on the other side. Um, so to do this, we're going to insert a new chunk. If I was doing this in real life, I would like have a heading here that said like dual y-axis and then explain what I'm doing. But we're not doing that. Um, if you look at the example page for today, I do that. That's how you can see that there's like text incorporated with the code and that's a normal R Markdown file. In real life, you should be doing that with your problem, with your exercises and your projects. Um, but for these videos, not going to do that. So here we want to make a plot. So we're going to say ggplot. We want to have the date on the x-axis because we want to show changes over time. Um, first, we want to say data equals weather ATL. That's the data set we want to use. And then we can say mapping equals AES. So our X variable, if we look back at our data set, is this column named time. So even though it's date, it's called time here. So X equals time. Y is going to be equal to, we want the high temperature column. So if we scroll through, there it is. It's called temperature high with a capital H. So temperature high. Okay, so if we just do that, we can add a line and say geom underscore line. If we run this, we should see, we'll shrink this down. We should see a nice line plot here showing that temperatures got hotter and hotter and hotter up until October. So yes, again, this was super surprising to me. Um, I thought it would like September would start cooling off, but it didn't. September was the same temperature as August, and then it suddenly dropped off. So hopefully that's not normal, because um, I like September to be fall-like and not summer-like. Um, so there we go. We have temperature going up and down, and that's nice. If we want, we can add some extra things like theme minimal to get rid of that gray background and just have a nice clean plot. That's nice. Um, we can add different labels, um, which we will, just so that we can say that the left side is definitely Fahrenheit. So we'll say labs y or X, we can actually just turn off because it's obvious that that's a date. So we don't need to say time there. So to turn off a label, you say X equals null, which means nothing. And then we can say Y equals Fahrenheit. And we add a plus sign here to connect it with the minimal. So now we should have a good basic plot with a clean X axis. And there's our degrees Fahrenheit on the, the left Y axis. But we want to add a second y-axis. And the way R lets you do this, the way ggplot lets you do this, is we can use a mathematical formula to translate this side into something else on the other side. And so the way we do this is we want to manipulate the, the y scale, because that's our aesthetic that we have. So we're going to say scale y continuous, because it, it's a continuous numerical scale. Um, the only argument we're going to deal with here is something called sec.axis, which lets us specify a secondary axis. And the way we do this is we then have to use a function called sec underscore axis. And this is the actual function that lets us manipulate the second axis and lets us specify the formula that we're using. And we can add a name to it and all sorts of stuff. Um, because this line is kind of getting long, I'm going to hit Enter right before uh, right before here, um, just so that we have a little bit more space to work with. So here in sec underscore axis, one of the arguments we have to specify is something called trans, which is the transformation that we're going to be using to convert Fahrenheit to whatever we have on the other, on the other axis. Um, and the syntax we use here is we use a tilde, which means that this is a function that we're doing. And then we can type the actual equation. And so I know this because I've looked it up and I have it on my other screen here, that the formula for converting from Fahrenheit to Celsius is 32 minus whatever the degrees Fahrenheit is. And so we use this dot as a placeholder for that. So 32 minus Fahrenheit times negative 5 ninths. That's the formula for converting Fahrenheit to Celsius. And I only know that because I went to Google. Um, and if we add a plus sign now, and run this, it got mad. 
because of something. This is fun because this is normal. I have an unexpected parenthesis. So I have an extra parenthesis here somewhere. So the nice thing about our studio is it'll actually count the parentheses. So we have one, two, three, and then we have one, two, three. What is going on here? There it goes. Fixed it. I don't know what was wrong. I just like brought this back up instead of breaking the line there, and it fixed it. So that's good. Um, so now if we look here, we have Fahrenheit on this side, and we have Celsius on this other side with 10 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius, 30 degrees Celsius. One drawback from using a secondary axis like this is it doesn't draw the plot lines or the, the grid lines using the secondary axis. So the 30 is kind of floating in the middle here and the 20 is kind of almost up to that line. That's okay. That's not the main axis that we care about. The main one is here. This is just kind of for reference so that we can remember what's going on. Um, if we want a label for this, so it says Celsius over on this side, um, that's another argument inside um, secondary axis. So after the trans uh, argument, we can then say name equals Celsius. So now it should have the degrees Celsius here with a label that says Celsius. And that works. And we could convert it to anything. That's the, that's the conversion for Fahrenheit. If we wanted, we could do, or for Celsius, we could do like Kelvin, which like is used in physics because it's super high numbers. Um, the formula for that also, because I just have it up on my screen here, is slightly different. It's not this. It is um, Fahrenheit, whatever the value is, minus 32 times 5 ninths plus 273.15. And this is Kelvin. So now if we run it, we have Fahrenheit on one side and Kelvin on the other side. So it was like 300 degrees Kelvin in April useless information, but there it is. Um, we can, any, any sort of transformation, we could do like the square root of Fahrenheit over on this side if we really wanted to. Don't know why you'd want to, but it's possible. So that's how you do dual y axes in R. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is how to combine plots. Because that was another alternative to using dual y axes, is just have multiple little plots that you stack up on top of each other. So we'll make a section here called combining plots. So the, what we do to combine plots is we use a package called Patchwork, which lets us add different ggplots together. So if we scroll back up to the top to our first chunk, we'll add a new library line and load the Patchwork library. And then press Command Enter to run it. So now we have that loaded. So if we come down here, what we're going to do is plot our temperature. So I can just grab this whole code here because we want this. And then we want to plot humidity underneath it so we can see if there's a relationship between high temperatures and humidity. So I'm just going to copy that code because I know it works. Come down here and paste it. The only thing we're going to change is we're going to save this as an object. We're going to call this temperature plot. And we're going to store that as an object. Um, if you notice, this mapping is no longer aligned with the ggplot here. It's kind of not formatted correctly. If I select all of this and then press Command I or Control I on Windows, it will reformat it all and kind of fix the indentation. So now if we move this a little bit more, you can see like this stuff all goes with ggplot and then we have g on line and scale x con scale y continuous is all one chunk and everything is nicely lined up and indented. Um, so now we have temperature plot. If I run it, I should see nothing. Um, that's because it made the plot and then saved it as this object here. If I want to see it, I can copy that. If I just run temperature plot by itself, it should show the temperature plot. You can also see it over in the environment panel that it saved this list. That's really just a plot. Um, so we also want a plot for humidity. So what we can do is just grab the same code here, copy it, and we'll paste it down here. Because I didn't get the name, the indentation is messed up again. So I can select this, press Command I, and it will re-indent. Um, instead of showing temperature on the y-axis, we want to show humidity on the y-axis. And if we look at the data set, the column is named, I think it's just named humidity with lowercase h. There it is, humidity, lowercase h. 
So if we come back here, we're going to change y to humidity. We're still going to plot it with a line. We don't need this scale y continuous because we're not showing humidity as degrees Kelvin. And we can change this to humidity instead of Fahrenheit. So if we run this, we can see what the plot looks like. There's humidity. Neat. Um, we can store this as a plot. So we'll just call this humidity plot equals this GD plot stuff. Again, mapping is now in the wrong place. So if I select those lines and press Command I, it will reindent for me. And so now I have two different plots. If I run this, I should have over here humidity plot and temperature plot. So if I want to show both of these together, because I've loaded patchwork, all I really have to do is say temperature plot plus humidity plot. And if I run that, hum oh, I spelled it wrong. I spelled it humdity plot. So we're just going to rename it and recreate it here as humidity plot. Now when I plot it, I should get two plots in one picture. And it put it side by side like this. And that's neat, but we want to be able to show the relationship between them. So if we put the humidity plot under the temperature, then they'll line up and we can see as humidity is changing what happens to temperature. So to do that, we can add um, a special function that comes from the patchwork library called plot underscore layout. And here we can say the number of columns we want is one. And we'll put these two plots in one column stacked on top of each other. Um, if we want to emphasize the Fahrenheit or the temperature plot more than humidity, we can actually make this taller relative to the whole plot. Right now it's dividing it 50-50. Um, but if we come in here, we can say height equals, and we can give it a list of percentages. So we can say, let's make the top one 70% and the bottom one 30%. So now if we run it, we should get a taller top plot and a skinnier bottom plot. And that looks nice. And so now we can make comparisons or we can check the relationship between Fahrenheit and humidity over time. And we see that there's not really a relationship. As humidity goes up, temperature is not really responding. Temperature is just going up by itself, um, up into 300 Kelvin, which is hot, I guess. OK, so that's how you use patchwork. Um, Next thing we want to do is look at correlations. So we want to look at the correlations between a few of the, the variables in our data set here. Um, to do this, we need to, to get a smaller data set. Right now we have a data set with 40 variables in it. We don't want to see the correlations between all 40 of those things, especially because lots of them aren't numeric. Some of them are just text. Like if we look at the beginning, this is rain starting in the afternoon. There's no way we can get the correlation between rain starting in the afternoon and and wind gust, like that doesn't work. That's just text. So we're going to make a smaller data set of variables that we want to correlate with each other. So we'll just add a new chunk here. And we'll call this one weather correlations. This is going to be based on weather Atlanta. But we're just going to select a few columns. We're going to say select. We want the temperature high. We want temperature low, because maybe they're related. They are. Um, we want humidity. We want wind speed. And we want precipitation probability. So we're going to select just those columns here. So if, if we look over in our environment panel, we now have an object here called um, weather correlations. It's a smaller data set that just has those five columns in there. So we want to see the relationships between all of these here. So to do that, we can use the ggpairs function that's in the ggalley library. So if we come back up to our libraries, let's shrink this down again. Come back to the libraries. We're going to load the ggalley library. So press Command Enter to run that line. Scroll down. So the nice thing about this ggalley uh, library and the ggpairs is all we have to do is feed it that one data set, which we called weather correlations. So if we run that, we should get, as it's thinking, it's making a bunch of plots. Neat. There it is. We have this 5 by 5 matrix here showing the relationship between 
all these different variables. And so we see that high temperature and low temperature are closely related. Um, that's a 0.92 correlation, which makes sense uh, because it's not like one day you're going to have a high of 95 and a low of negative 20. Um, they're going to be very closely connected throughout the day. Um, these other variables, surprisingly, aren't very correlated. So wind speed, not correlated at all with high temperature or low temperature. It's just kind of a big blob here. Um, you can look at these other correlation values. Humidity and precipitation probability are correlated, which, again, makes sense. When it rains, it is wet outside, so there's more humidity. Um, so now we can tell cool stories there. Um, if we want to make a fancy corellogram, um, I'm not going to include the code here, or I'm not going to walk through the code. I will copy it from the more polished version on the website um, where I explain more of what's going on. Essentially, what we can do is when you use the correlation function, the COR in R, that if you just feed it two variables, like high temperature and low temperature, it will spit out a single number. If you feed it a bunch of variables, like all of these uh, temperature high, temperature low, etc., it will figure out the correlation between each of the pairs and create a matrix for it. So if you look at this, this thing's to correlate. If we look at this data set now, this is what it looks like. It's this matrix. So there's perfect correlation all along the diagonal here because high temperature is perfectly correlated to high temperature. Um, but you can also see all the other correlations here. The trick to making the correlograms, the, the heat maps and the dot plots, is we have to manipulate this matrix into a tidy data frame where we have a column for each of these names and a column for the values of these names. So really, we have to take this, this matrix and rearrange it and reorganize it. And that's how it's going to work in ggplot. The code to do all of that is in um, the example code on the website. It's kind of long. Um, I have it fully annotated where it explains what each step is doing, where it's converting a matrix to a data frame and then adding a column and renaming one of the columns and then kind of rearranging stuff. It should walk you through each of the steps. And by the time you finish, you should have a cool correlogram that looks something like that. Um, there's the heat map version and there is the um, dot version. So you can see that precipitation probability and humidity, that's a big blue dot because they're closely correlated positively. High and low temperature, also a big blue dot. Wind speed and high temperature, the windier it is, um, the lower the temperature it is. Um, they're negatively correlated also with low temperature, but none of the other things really have any strong correlation. Um, so that's, that's how you can make these correlograms. Again, the code is kind of a little bit complicated. Um, the nice thing about this is it's generalizable. So once you get, like if you're doing this with your own data, if you can get a matrix of these correlations with whatever variables you have, um, this code will work for that. You just have to plug in, instead of using things to correlate, you use the name of whatever you called your matrix, and it will do everything for you and you'll end up with a data set that looks like this, with a column for each of the names and then the, the actual correlation value. And this is the tidy version of that matrix. So we'll skip that in the video, but you can see on the website, that's how we do it. Okay, so the next thing we wanna do is to visualize regressions. So we'll add a section here called regression. <clears throat> so to do this regression, we're going to look at just a subset of the data. And this is because when you're, do when you're dealing with regressions, you're drawing lines. And they're generally straight lines if you're dealing with ordinary least squares regression. If we look back up to this plot here, because this is what we're going to show, is the relationship between something like this. We're going to show the relationship between temperature and humidity. And what ends up happening is in the earlier day, like in the winter, you're going to have less humidity and lower temperatures, and then it's going to go up, and then it's going to go down. And so we have a curve, and we don't really want to work with the curve because if you draw a line here, it's going to go, it's going to miss all of these, it's going to miss all of these, and kind of go straight across the middle. So we're going to subset the data so that we're only looking at the summer because that's going to be kind of where there's a stronger relationship um, going up. If we look at the winter, we should see kind of the inverse relationship. So we're going to insert a new chunk here. And we're going to make a new data set that is just kind of the summer or hot months in Atlanta. So we're going to call this data set weather ATL summer. And this is going to be 
based on whether underscore ATL, and we'll add a pipe, that's command shift M or control shift M, and we want to filter, and we want to use the time column, which I accidentally closed here, so let's look back here. So we want to use this time column, and we want to choose rows that are above a certain time and before a different time. So we want to choose rows, so we can say time is greater than or equal to, and we can actually just give it a date here. We can say 2019-05-01. So we're going to choose from May 1st, and if we just run this, it'll go from May 1st to December 31st, but we want to cut it off. So we'll say time is less than or equal to, and we'll choose uh, September 30th. So we'll say 2019-09-30. So if we run this now, and we look at whether, here it is, whether ATL summer, it's the same big data set with all of the columns, but now it starts May 1st, and it should end on September 30th. So it's just kind of the warmer months, um, and that's good. We're going to add one mutate line here to change some of the variables just so that it works better when we're interpreting regression. Um, if you look at some of these columns here, this pre precipitation probability, this is on a scale of 0 to 1. And so that means that's an 83% chance of rain, and that's a 14% chance of rain. When you're dealing with regression, though, you're talking about whole units. And so when we're talking about sliders, we're moving the precipitation probability slider from 0 to 1. And so really that means you're moving from 0% chance of rain to 1% chance or 100% chance of rain, which is a huge jump and that's not really helpful when you're interpreting this stuff. So if we multiply this column by 100, then this will be 76 instead of 0.76. And so then when we interpret the regression, we can say as you move from 70 to 71 or 71 to 72, what happens with temperatures as you're changing the probability of precipitation. Um, and that makes it easier to interpret. And so some of these columns are, are kind of on that scale. Humidity, that's percent humidity. Um, so we want to scale that up to 100. Um, so some of these columns that we're going to include in a regression model, we can mutate it here just to make them bigger. Um, so we'll make humidity scaled equals the humidity column times 100. Um, we're also going to be dealing with moon phase to see if maybe that has an influence on temperatures. And that's also a percent. So we'll say moon phase times 100. Um, we want precipitation probability underscore scaled, just so we don't overwrite the column. And that's going to be precip probability times 100. Um, if you notice, I forgot to put moon phase underscore scaled, so it would have overwritten our moon phase column. And then the last one, we want to use cloud cover. Underscore scaled equals cloud cover times 100. Okay, so now if we run this and we look at whether ATL summer, and we scroll all the way to the end, we should have some new columns here for the scaled versions of humidity and moon phase and precipitation and things like that. So that's good. Okay, so we're going to build a simple regression model first. So we're going to insert a new chunk down here, and we're going to call this model simple. So the syntax for this is we're going to use linear model. We have to specify the outcome variable, which is temperature high. And then we use this tilde sign which is R's way of saying equals, but in a regression. The way I read this when I write this code and when I read the code out loud is I say, is explained by. So we say temperature high is explained by, um, and we're just going to use humidity scaled. And the data set that we're looking at is weather ATL summer. So if I run this, it built a model and we see nothing. Um, if you scroll down in your environment panel, you'll see that we have a thing called model simple. That's just this list. If you click on it, it shows a whole bunch of behind the scenes stuff that you can't really do much with. Um, one way to look at the results is we can use summary model simple. And if we run that, we'll get a big wall of text showing all of the coefficients and a whole bunch of extra information here. Um, and this is kind of 
if you've used R before and haven't used the tidyverse ver like flavor of R, this is the typical way you do this. The tricky part about this is if I want to extract this 104 or this coefficient here, there's not really an easy way to do it. If I want to like plot these things, it's kind of stuck in here. Um, and so what we can do is we can use functions in a package called broom. So if we come back up to where we load all our libraries, we'll use a package called broom. And what this does is it converts model results into data frames. And then we can do stuff with the data frames, like filter them, mutate them, we can plot them, we can do all sorts of stuff. So if we come back down here to model simple, instead of saying summary model simple, we're going to say tidy model simple. And if we run that, we should get a nice little data frame here showing there's our intercept is 104 degrees. And then there's our humidity level. Um, that's our slope there, the negative 0.24. So if we want to interpret this, what this means is when there's no humidity at all, um, the average temperature is going to be 104 degrees. That's our intercept if we were drawing a line. And then every time humidity goes up by a percent, the temperature is going to go down by 0.24 degrees. Um, and so that's, that's what this is showing. If we want to visualize that, we can plot it. We can say ggplot. Um, we actually don't need to worry about the model itself because um, when you use geom smooth, it will run a linear model for you behind the scenes. So we can just use um, data equals weather ATL summer. We're going to say AES, the X is going to be humidity scaled, and the Y is going to be temperature high. And we'll just say geom point and run that. And we should see a scatter plot. And if we want to add a line to that, we can say plus geom smooth. If we don't specify anything in there, it's going to do a curvy line um, using something called low S smoothing, where it's kind of looking at a, a average window or the average within a window as it's moving. And so it's kind of this curvy thing. If we want it to be a straight line, like our linear model, we can change the method here inside geom smooth. We can say method equals LM. And now if we run it, we should get a nice straight line. There we go. So the slope of this line, this blue line here, is what we found here, which was the negative 0.24. So every time humidity goes up a, a unit, so from 50 to 51, the predicted temperature is going down by 0.24 degrees and 0.24 degrees again and 0.24 degrees again. So if it's going from 50 to 60, that's going to go down by two, two and a half degrees, 2.4 degrees. And so that's the relationship between humidity and temperature in a simple regression model. Um, but that is not, humidity is not the only thing that explains why temperature is the way it is. Cloud cover explains it. Rain explains it. Maybe the moon phase explains it. Maybe it's hotter when there's a full moon. I don't know. Um, so we can look at the effects of all of those different variables if we use multiple regression. So what we're going to do is add a new chunk, and we're going to make a new model called model big. And this is going to be a normal linear model again. We'll actually come up and copy the code because we know it works. So we'll copy this, this temperature high, explained by humidity scaled. Um, data equals weather Atlanta summer. So we're going to copy this. We're going to paste it in here. But we're going to add some other explanatory variables. We don't want to just look at humidity. Um, we're going to look at a whole bunch of things like moon phase scaled plus precipitation probability scaled. plus wind speed, plus the barometric pressure, plus cloud cover, scaled. And we're going to still use that Atlanta weather summer. We'll reformat it with command I. So here's our big model. We can look at the results if we do tidy model big. OK. So now we have a bunch of results. Um, the intercept is gigantic. We can ignore that. What that really means is 
on a day in the summer where you have zero humidity, no moon, no chance of rain, no wind, no pressure, and no cloud cover, then it should be 262 degrees outside, which is pretty useless because that's impossible. That's never going to happen. So we can ignore um, kind of that intercept. But the other things we can interpret. We can wind speed right here is negative and it's fairly large. Um, if we scroll through, you should probably see all of these things because your screen's not as zoomed in as mine. Um, but this is statistically significant. It's a big effect. Um, it's most likely not zero. And so what we can say is like as wind speed increases, so every one mile an hour that wind speed increases, the temperature should drop by point or 1.77 degrees on average. It's associated with that. It's not a causal thing. It could be that the wind is not blowing as much because it's colder or hotter or something, um, but it's associated with kind of lower temperatures because of more wind. Um, and you can, if you're doing an actual analysis, you would then go and interpret these coefficients and one, look at the ones you care about and explain what's going on and what the effects are. Um, but we're interested in plotting this thing. We want to see all of these coefficients at the same time to see if they're different from zero, to see how big the errors are, um, so we can better understand what's going on here. So to do this, we can take this tidy data frame and save it as an object and then plot that object. So we're going to make a new, oh, we'll leave tidy there. We'll make a new chunk down here. We'll make a data set here called model coefficients, spelled correctly. And this is going to be, we're going to tidy that model that we called model big. We're going to add an argument here for confidence intervals. We'll say conf int equals true. So that way we get columns. Right now, if you look here, it ends at p-value. But if we say conf int equals true, then we'll also have the 95% confidence intervals, which we can then plot. So we want to turn that on. So if we run this, we should see nothing because it just saved it as an object called model coefficients. If we come here and look at it, we can see we have these two new columns here for confidence low and confidence high with all the other values here. We don't care about this intercept row because, again, that's meaningless, this 262 degrees. So we can actually get rid of it. Because this is a data frame, all the dplyr things that we've been working with, like group by and summarize and filter and select, they work. So we can add a pipe here and we can say filter. Let's get rid of that intercept row. So we can say term, that's the name of the column, term is not equal to, and then in quotes, we have to put exactly what it has here. So intercept with a capital I in parentheses. So we'll say intercept. So if we run this, and then we check the model coefficients object, it starts with humidity scaled, there's no intercept term, and we're ready. Okay, so now we want to plot this thing. We're going to come and do ggplot. The data is model coefficients. And the mapping is going to be asx is. So here we want the actual coefficient along the x-axis. And we want to have a point there. So that column is called estimate. So we'll say x equals estimate. On the y-axis, we want to have the names of each of the coefficients that are in our, or each of the terms in our model. And that column is called term. So say y equals term. And just for fun to make sure we have it working, we'll say geom underscore point. And if we look at this, here's our points, here's the actual coefficients from our model. There's lots of clustering around here at zero, and then there's wind speed over here that's kind of a bigger negative slope. Um, and the points are nice, but we also want the errors around these points. We want to see how much variation there is in that estimate to see how accurate it might be. So to do that, instead of saying geom point, we'll use geom point range. And here we have to specify two more aesthetics. We have to tell it the minimum x value and the maximum x value. So in AES, we can say x min equals something. When we were doing the lollipop charts, we would say x min or y min equals zero so that the line would start at zero and go up to the point. We don't want to do that here because we want to actually show kind of the error bars around things here. Um, so we have a column in our data set called conf low. That's where we want one end of the bar to start. So we want x min equals conf low and we want x max to equal conf 
high. So now if we run it, we should get points with error bars around. So this is the 95% confidence intervals for each of these model coefficients. Um, if we want to see how different these things are from zero, um, if we want to check for statistical significance, um, the way we do that is we can add another geom here, geom v line for vertical line, and we can specify the x-intercept for that line at zero. And if we run that, we should get a vertical line right there at zero. If we want to set that off to make it um, more visible, we can say color equals orange, or get a hex color from Google or do something, and there's a neat line showing where there is no effect. So most of our coefficients are down there at no effect land. Cloud cover is significantly different from zero, but it's very tiny. So as it gets cloudier, it is kind of a little bit cooler. Um, temperature goes down, but not by a lot, by like 0.2. How big is that? We can look at the actual number, 0.09. So temperature goes down by 0.01 every time there's more cloud cover, which isn't a huge effect. The big effect here is wind speed. And we can see that in our coefficient plot. OK, the last thing we want to do is the marginal effects plot. And this is where we take the analogy of the sliders and the switches, and we apply it to visualizations. What we want to do is we want to see the effect. Um, the most important, like the one that actually matters here is wind speed. So we want to see what happens as we move wind speed up and down. How much does that influence temperatures? Um, and so what we can do is move wind speed around, hold all of these other variables at their means and not move them. And then we can plot what happens as you change wind speed. So to do that, we have to go through a couple steps. First, we need to create a data set of the, the simulated data that we want to use. We want to have a whole range of wind speeds. And then we want to have all of these different average values here. So we're going to create a new data set called new data. And this is going to be, we're going to use the tibble function, which makes a data frame or a, a table. And here we have to specify columns for each of the um, variables we have in our model. So what I like to do is I like to come back up to where we ran the model, and I copy all of those explanatory variables so that I know that I have them all. I come down here into tibble and paste it. And then instead of saying humidity scaled plus whatever, we need to set humidity scaled equal to something and moon phase scaled equal to something. So I'm getting rid of those plus signs and just kind of leaving the, the equal side blank. So precipitation probability equals something. Wind speed equals something. Pressure equals something. And cloud cover scaled equals something. OK, so what we need to do is give these actual numbers. Um, we could hand type the numbers and say maybe humidity is 80 and moon phase is 50%, so like half moon. Um, and there's a 50% chance of rain. Um, we could do that. Or we could be more systematic and just say, what's the average value of humidity and the average moon phase and the average precipitation? Um, to do that, we have to use kind of um, older syntax for, for dealing with R. If we take the name of our data set, which was uh, Atlanta or Weather ATL Summer, we can come here and say, we want this to be the mean of Weather ATL Summer, and we want the mean of one column in that data set. So to access one column in a data set, you type the name of the data set and then dollar sign, and then the name of the column, which was humidity scaled. OK, so if we do that, it will calculate the average humidity um, in the whole data set. And so if we just kind of repeat this, we'll copy this. And instead of moon phase scaled being 50, we'll just paste that there and change humidity scaled to the average moon phase scaled. Same thing here. Instead of precipitation probability scaled, we want it the average of precip probability scaled. Wind speed we'll leave alone for a minute because that's the one we want to change. Pressure is going to be average pressure. And cloud cover is going to be the average cloud cover scaled. Wind speed, though, this is the one that we want to manipulate. We want it to go up and down. 
Um, and so what we need to do is, instead of giving it a single value, we'll give it a sequence of values. And we'll use this seq function. So here we give it a starting number and an ending number and how many numbers to put in between. Um, we want it to match the range of data in the actual data set. Like we don't want wind speeds of like 50. Um, so if we look at our data set, what I typically do is I come and I find the wind speed column somewhere here, and then I sort by it to see what kind of the lowest wind speed is and the highest wind speed is. So if I click here, um, the lowest is two miles an hour. The highest is seven miles an hour. So if we have it range from two to seven, that should be good. That's going to be different for every data set that you work with, every variable you work with. You have to check and see what the range is. So we want it to go from two to seven. Um, the more granular you get, the smoother the line is going to be. We could technically just go two, three, four, five, six, seven and call that good, but then it's going to be kind of a chunky line. Um, if we go two, 2.1, 2.2, 2 2.3, all the way up to seven, it's going to have more rows, but it's going to be a smoother line. So I like to do that. So we can say by equals 0 0.1. And so it should go from 2, 2.1, 2.2, etc. Um, if I run this now, we should have a new data set called new data, where we have a whole bunch of repeated things. So humidity is 64 all the way down. Moon phase is 50 all the way down. Everything is the same all the way down except wind speed, which goes from 2 up to 7 by 0.1. Everything else is at its average, though. So what we can do is now is if we plug this data set into the model and have it essentially plug in each of these numbers and calculate the predicted temperature, we can then plot that. I keep trying to close that tab. So we'll add a new chunk here. So the way we do that is we use the augment function that's in the broom package. That lets us take a data frame and plug it into a model and get predictions out of it. So we're going to make a new data set called predictions equals. So we're going to use augment. We have to feed it two things. We give it the name of the model, which was model underscore big. And then we give it the name of the new data set. So we say new data equals, and we named it new data. So that looks repetitive, but that's because this is the name of the thing, name of the argument. This is the actual name of the data set we created. Okay, so if I hit OK, we should now have a column called predictions, which is the same as the new data. Um, but now there are a few extra columns at the end called fitted and standard error for the fit. And so this is saying, given all of these conditions, the predicted temperature for that day for those conditions should be 91 degrees. If you scroll down, the faster the wind speed is, um, the lower the predicted temperature is. It's only 82 now. Um, and so it's getting lower, which we knew because it has a negative coefficient, but now we can actually plot that. <clears throat> so what we can do now is add ggplot, and we can say data equals predictions. We're going to use that new data frame. Our aesthetics, on the x-axis, we want um, wind speed because that's the thing we're varying. So we're seeing as we bump wind speed up and down what happens to temperature. On the y-axis, though, before we were saying um, temperature high, we don't have that column anymore. Um, we now have a column called fitted um, because this is the predicted temperature, not the actual temperature. And it starts with a dot for whatever reason. So we say y equals dot fitted. What I often do is I actually, in this predictions thing, I'll add a new layer and say rename. And then like I'll say like predicted temp equals dot fitted. That way I can work with not this dot fitted thing. And now if I look at predictions, the column is called predicted temp instead of fitted. And so that makes it easier to work with. I'll just leave it as fitted though for this example. But in real life, I like to simplify things. So y equals fitted. And now what we can do is add a line, geom line. And if we plot that, it broke because it says object prediction not found. And that's because I'm trying to use a data set named prediction, but the actual data set I made is called predictions. So add an S and run it. And now we should get a nice line plot. 
that shows that as you increase wind speed, the temperature, the predicted temperature goes down. And that's our effect that we're seeing, and that's good. Um, we have information about the errors. We have these, the standard error. Um, we can add the standard error into the fitted um, prediction and get a 95% confidence interval for it. We can either do that here in the ggplot code. I don't like doing that because um, then if I want to make another plot using the same confidence intervals, I have to do it again in the plot. I like to do it in the actual data set itself so that it's in one place. So what we can do is add a mutate line to this pipeline here. And we're going to use some math from statistics to calculate the confidence intervals. So the way you do this, um, and again, I like typed this once a few years ago, and I've just been like copying and pasting the same code ever since. We're going to make a column called confidence low. And this is that fitted value, so our predicted value. But we want to subtract um, the, the standard error to get kind of a lower bound for a confidence interval. So to do that, we're going to say plus negative 1.96 times that SE fit column. So what that'll do is it, it uses statistics to find kind of the 2.5th percentile of a normal distribution, multiplies that by the standard error, and then it's going to add it to the fitted prediction, and that's gonna lower it. If we want an upper bound, we do the same thing, conf high equals, so we're gonna take that fitted variable and we're going to, instead of doing negative 1.96, we'll just do 1.96 times the dot se dot fit column. And the only reason there's two dots there is because that's the actual name of the column in predictions. Like if you scroll over, it is dot se dot fit. Okay, so now if I run this and we look at predictions, we should have our fitted value, but now we have a lower bound of our confidence interval and an upper bound of our confidence interval. So it's 91 on, in these conditions, but it could be as low as 90.1 or as high as 93.4. So if we want to actually show that, we can add a geom to do that. I like to put this geom behind the line, so it's kind of the shaded area and then the line on top. Um, just so that the line is more visible because we don't want to have like this big shaded area hiding stuff. So I put it above geom line. We'll do geom underscore ribbon. And we have to specify a couple um, new aesthetics here. So we say AES. So what we need to specify is the y min equals conf low. So this is similar to the, the point range that we were doing before. And then y max equals conf high. And then we'll add a plus there. So now we should get a ribbon and a line. So that's kind of ugly because the ribbon is super dark and the line is even darker. So it's really hard to see. Had I had this reversed with the line first and then the ribbon, we wouldn't even see the line because the ribbon would entirely cover it. So what I like to do is to make this ribbon semi-transparent. So I'll say like alpha equals 0 0.3, make it 30% transparent, sure, there. Now we have predicted temperatures as you move up with wind speed. So we're manipulating just that one slider, keeping all the other variables in the model constant. And we can see that as we're moving wind speed up, it has a significant effect on um, predicted temperature. If this was insignificant and the slope was basically zero, what we would see is a completely horizontal line. We would just see, like, as you're moving wind speed up, nothing's happening to temperature. Um, but because this was significant and negative, we see that it's going down, and um, we can see the actual results of our multiple regression model. Um, on the example page on the course website, I show another example of how to do this, but to move multiple variables. And so I actually move cloud cover and wind speed at the same time and facet by cloud cover, so you can see um, that as cloud cover increases, um, what was the relationship? As cloud cover increases, temperatures go down, which makes sense. The cloudier it is, the less hot it is. Um, but then also wind speed brings that down too. So you can see both dimensions at the same time in a single plot, which is really exciting um, because you can visualize the effects of multiple regression models using ggplot without just using scatter plots on one dimension. So that's how you do this stuff in R. 
um, in your exercise for today, you'll get practice doing this and it should be hopefully fun and exciting. And you can do this in your future work um, if you do anything with regression. So good luck.